morning. Welcome to VRDC, and uh, welcome to my talk. We're going to talk about web VR building for the immersive web. My name is Tony Parisi. Um, as of five days ago, I work at Unity Technologies. Here's a little bit more about me. Yeah, um, so I've been working in the field of uh, web and virtual reality for uh, a long time now, coming on 20 years, and I was remarking to a buddy of mine who's sitting in the front row. Uh, he, he remembered that we were here at a conference together 20 years ago, so uh, dating myself, and it was, it was web and VR. <laughs> um, and here we are, 20 years later, and, and this stuff kind of works, so that's great. Um, I'm based in San Francisco. I do a lot of work with startups in the city. I run a couple of meetup groups, one for WebGL, one for WebVR. Um, I've written three books for O'Reilly, two on WebGL development, a uh, more recent one on how to get started learning how to program in VR, called Learning Virtual <laughs> Reality. And uh, yeah, I was working on a lot of web stuff, and then in a dramatic plot twist, I um, joined Unity, and I'm um, running VR and AR for them as of uh, last week. And um, we're not really making any particular uh, statements or, or uh, you know, product plan announcements about web VR because of that. So, so people have been asking about that uh, who are in the know, and that's not exactly happening yet. But uh, you know, I care about web, G web VR and WebGL a lot, um, and the company's done a lot of stuff in WebGL in the past. So uh, you, know, you can infer what you will from that. Um, anyway, let's get rolling. Um, so I think uh, most of us who like VR are sort of feeling like this is the next computing platform. We're not just talking about a game technology, we're talking about being able to use it for everything. Um, big investments are being made in the industry. Um, we have a few million units being shipped right now, but you know, a lot of folks think we're going to have billions of headsets out in the next, uh, somewhere in the next seven to ten years, right? Um, so that makes me ask myself, and uh, I'd ask you to ponder, how can we actually reach a billion headsets? And in my opinion, we're not going to be able to do that one app at a time through app stores. And that's a lot. That's going to be a theme I'm going to talk about a few times today. Um, and that's a lot about uh, why we're looking at something like WebVR. Uh, so if you're an end user and you want to find good VR experiences, right, so you have to do that through an app store, basically looking through a tile-based interface. Discovery is pretty difficult. And then when you actually discover something, you have to download and install an application. So that's friction, 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 which works great if you have a particular game you want to play or this is a cinematic piece that you really know you want um, and you're willing to put your time and attention into going to get it. But if not, and in the world we're in, you know, most people don't have that much time and attention. Um, that can be death for people who are trying to get content or experiences into someone's hands. Um, same with discovery. I mean, how do I find that stuff right now? You know, it's not a great experience looking for things in an app store uh, because you're scrolling a lot. Now, that might change over time, and, and these, uh, these technologies for finding things may get a little better, but they can't compare to, say, me sharing a link with you in a tweet and you clicking on the link and going getting, and getting that information. And we do that all the time in the web. We do that all the time with social media. Uh, there isn't a good way to do that in VR until now. Um, we can connect, if we use web technologies, we can actually connect applications up in VR, experiences in VR. So if, if you're in one thing, you can you know, basically click on a, a, some sort of portal and jump right to it. It could be an ad, it could be a, you know, designed in experience. Um, that kind of thing. I mean, the mobile app world is just barely getting started on figuring out how to hyperlink their applications together in the web. We've been doing that for 20 years. Um, and with web VR, with this technology where it's built on web tech, um, imagine you can actually integrate all the Mashable APIs that have been out there, hundreds, thousands of APIs um, that give you data for anything, Wikipedia, you know, stock data, map data. I'm going to show you a map demo momentarily. Um, this is such a great idea. It's not just you know, me and a few crazy people being smart and talking about it for 20 years. It's uh, this, the industry is getting together and working on this. Everybody who's got a browser is supporting uh, the technologies I'm going to talk to you about now. Um, including uh, you know, some of the VR stalwarts have been making some serious investments lately, like Oculus and Samsung. Um, and the press is all over it now, so it's a thing. Web VR is now a thing. It's no longer just a cool idea. Let me show you a quick demo. Um, this is based on a project that I actually worked on before jo joining Unity. I was getting a little startup going. Oculus had uh, approached us about doing a Web VR showcase for their Connect conference last month, their developer conference in San Jose. And what we did was we actually built um, an experience where you could put the Rift on and you had tabletop scale San Francisco. You were sort of King Kong or Godzilla height looking over in downtown SF in the Transamerica building. And when you gazed on a hotel, you'd get a pop-up that looks like this. 
in the screenshot. If you gazed on one of those teardrop map icons, you would teleport to another viewpoint. It's a really nice experience that I'm going to show you in a second because I'm going to load it in my browser. Stop that. All right, so that, by the way, was not pre-cached. This just happened, if you know what a, a cache is in a browser. This just came over the web, over the wire on this, what I'm going to assume is not the best in the world Wi-Fi connection because we're at a hotel in a conference. I'm rolling over and I'm getting these divs, if you know your HTML, I'm basically getting pop-up information that's actually based on TripAdvisor's data using the real API. We worked with them. They have a lab in New York that's been investigating new technologies like VR. Get a little roll over here. If I click, I do an instant teleport. When we do this in VR, we do a dissolve. So basically, this whole thing works in an Oculus Rift 2. It wouldn't be very interesting for me to show you, and I would have had to bring my giant laptop to do it right now, so I didn't bother doing that. But this exact same code base will run in an Oculus Rift, load just as fast, and that was just a URL. I clicked that for my bookmarks bar here to start this. Um, and there was no app store or anything. So again, that scenario where I said, I could send you a tweet or an email, you would be able to just do that. Now this is running an experimental version of Chrome. I'm going to go over what, how the browsers work in a second. But this is basically just browser tech. So think about that for a minute. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. This is going to be mildly technical, but only for a couple of minutes of this whole talk. I'm going to try and stay high level here. Has everybody in the room here heard of WebGL? Pretty much, say, 80% of you or so. Um, so WebGL is 3D rendering technology that is basically the same rendering technology that's in your phone, OpenGL, that you play all your games with. Right? It's the graphics pipeline that's basically on every computer and mobile device in the world. Connected to JavaScript. So you write an HTML5 application for your browser. You write JavaScript code, and it does graphics. You can build MMOs with this. You can build architectural walkthroughs. You can build like the demo I showed you. Uh, that's based on open map data. You can build anything with it. You can build uh, with a 3D graphics pipeline, and it runs everywhere. And so we rely on that. So the big innovations for WebGR were not in rendering. We already had that, and it's been out since about 2011. Um, here are the big innovations. So about two years ago, the folks from Mozilla, the people who actually, the, the engineer who created WebGL, started working on an experiment to connect an Oculus Rift to Firefox. His name is Vlad Vukovic. And uh, he started working with Brandon Jones from the Chrome team in the spring of 2014. And by the summer of 2014, they came to our WebGL meetup and demoed together the same thing working in both Firefox and Chrome, where you could connect an Oculus Rift HMD to your browsers. And it was really experimental, really early, um, 60 frames a second at best head tracking. So if you're in VR, you'd sort of look around. And it would look beautiful, but after about two minutes, you get motion sick, sort of the way you do with you know, cardboard. Um, so, you know, sort of very short duration. So nothing that would really rival anything you could do in a in native code in an HMD. Uh, but that changed over the last couple of years, and actually they have a tracking at 90 hertz refresh rate. Uh, the uh, demo I referenced there is working really smoothly. There's no lag. You can, you can stay in there for hours. Um, and so that's because we added APIs to track and then you use, use your WebGL to render in stereo. And then there's also experimental extensions um, in another API in a browser where you can use the hand controllers in a Vive or the Oculus Touch controllers or presumably Daydream 3 DOF controllers when the Daydream browsers come out. And uh, this stuff's working great. It's all, again, in new browsers. So I've got a little matrix here for you. Um, so as I mentioned, we have Firefox and Chrome, but it's more than that. Uh, Microsoft has announced support for Edge. They did a blog posting about this about a month ago. Uh, they have not committed to any release dates. Um, the Samsung Internet Browser, the mobile browser for Gear VR, has actually had support for this for coming on a year. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, there's a mobile Chromium version that's coming out for Daydream. And then Oculus is actually building their own optimized browser because they're just you know, voracious about performance. And so the Samsung one was a little bit laggy, so they decided to take the same code base, open source Chrome, it's called Chromium, and customize it, make sure it performed really well. So they've got a project code named Carmel, and they're going to release a mobile browser later this year they've committed to. Um, and I think that's that whole list. I mentioned Microsoft already. So, and presumably they're going to do it for HoloLens, but they haven't announced specific plans. But one clue is that they've been working with the people building that API, and they made some adjustments to that API uh, a few weeks ago based on the need to track certain things more finely, which sounded like it was coming from an AR set of requirements. So we think it's HoloLens. All right, this is where we're going. 
get a little bit technical. Uh, anybody in the room a JavaScript programmer? How many we got in here? All right, so you'll follow this along, but we'll stay high level and I'll, I'll try to not you know, get too much in the reads here. Um, but again, very small amount of extensions to uh, the current browsers to do this, because we are already rendering in WebGL. That was the big one to be able to do 3D. Um, and the first thing you have to do is find out if you actually have a head-mounted display attached to your browser. Then, once you know that you can do that, you set up to present content to it. We'll go through the details of this. Um, during your run loop, you're basically you know, refreshing your display all the time, hopefully at 90 hertz or better in your application. Um, you know, there's code to do that. We'll go through that. And, and then you, know, you basically do that based on where the camera, or, you know, where the head-mounted display is, and you update your camera, so where, where it's positioned and where it's looking. So we're going to go through all those. So here we go, there's some code. Is that readable up on the screen? That's pretty good, right? Yeah, so basically uh, the idea here is, and if you're familiar with JavaScript programming, you do a lot of things asynchronously. You write some code, and then you're going to get called back with the result later. Uh, this is no exception. The way you do that is you ask the displays, VR displays that I can talk to. If you do, you get a call back, and you get a list of them. And most code just grabs the first item in the list. I don't know why you do anything more than that, but. I think they're trying to future-proof it in case you have multiple HMDs you're attached to on one computer. Um, so you're typically going to grab that first one. And this is the, once you have that object, you're going to use that to pretty much do all the rest of your web VR. Um, so that's just getting the device. You now, so, you know, you tucked it away in your JavaScript code in a global, in a, in a property somewhere in an object, however you do your coding. It's, you know, your choice. That is just the browser giving you that, you know, object back. Um, now what you're going to do is, when it's time to basically Full screen. If, if you saw that version, where it had uh, the version of the demo I showed, there was a little piece of text in the front. Uh, you actually are going to do something like that. You'll hand a, u a user gesture from the flat screen for now. I mean, we're not going to talk about browsing the entire metaverse in VR just yet. So imagine you got this by being on your flat screen. Somebody sent you a link, or you knew the URL. You open this page, and you're going to you know, click on something to get this started. Once that click happens, um, to call something called request present. That basically asks the browser, can you go into full screen mode? And in the future, what's going to happen is this can't be element in HTML5 is just a rectangle that you draw to. That thing where you're drawing bits is going to be the place where all the content gets dumped every time you refer to it. Okay. So you're set up for that presentation mode. And if someone hits the escape key, for example, to get out or some other you know, widget to get out of the presentation, you can hit exit present. So those are basically start and stop your display mode. And as I mentioned, you actually do this thing where um, you do this to get started with some user gesture. That's actually a security measure. It's out or it's good? Good. Yeah, OK, cool. Well, I'll do my best. Um, you actually need to do this so the browser can't do a, a full screen takeover without the user doing a gesture. It's sort of a security measure. It's typical in browser land, and it's often annoying to us developers. But in the end of the day, uh, most of the time, it's around the end user's uh, safety so that you can't do a takeover and start stealing credit card info or, I don't know, snow crashing them, right? Hitting them, giving them a little like mind virus without them asking for it. I mean, it's all good if you want to do that to me if I've asked for it, right? Mutual consent. Um, yeah, so then um, that's all good. So we're basically set up. We got a device. We now have the mechanism to actually blit to it. But um, that doesn't do the graphics. We still need to draw. What do you got there? Another lab mic? Do you think it's my mic? All right. Slight pause. All right, so we still need to draw. And here's what we do. Um, if you've done JavaScript programming for graphics, you're quite familiar with something called refresh uh, request animation frame. What you're doing is you're asking the browser to call you back when it's ready to draw all the contents of the page for the entire page, including any you know, user code. So this is where it's going to lay out all its buttons and everything that's built in, but it's also going to then draw the contents of your canvas because you requested that. So then it calls your JavaScript code and you draw the contents of that canvas. And what you do is you ask the browser to do that, and once it's done it and called your callback, you ask it again, and you sort of go into this loop. This is basically what we call a run loop. We've been doing HTML animation this way on canvases and WebGL for five or six years now. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we created a new version of doing this that's attached to the head-mounted display. For this reason that I mentioned, I, I, I sort of uh, touched on it earlier. 
we were getting the 60 hertz refresh rate thing going on that was making people sick in WebVR because the browser had never had a good reason to refresh at six, higher than 60 hertz prior to virtual reality. Well, now it does. So they refactored these API so you basically now refresh at the native rate of the VR display. So when the VR display is ready to draw again, it's going to call your code. And so now you're getting this smooth 90 hertz. I mean, I think about 90 hertz and two eyes. You actually have to write JavaScript code that will draw the scene you know, 180 times a second if you're doing this right. So you got to have some smart JavaScript code. You got to use WebGL really well and throw everything on the graphics card. But it's doable, and, and uh, we're making that work, and the, the early returns are really good. Um, so you do all your drawing uh, based on where the camera is. I'm going to get to that in a second. You draw your scene. You're done. Great. And you say submit frame. That's the magic that takes the contents of the canvas you just drew to and throws it to the HMD. And now you get this you know, smooth 90 hertz magic. And then the way we head track is we have one, one more piece of API, which is get pose. This just gives us the position and orientation of the head mounted display so that we know where the camera is and where it's pointing so we can do our normal graphics. That's how 3D graphics work. You have a virtual camera somewhere in your 3D scene. You point it that way you know, with a particular field of view, and you tell your graphics system to draw everything within the visible area in front of you. Um, and so if you do that and you're tracking where the camera is and, and where it's pointing, you'll be able to give people a sense of presence that they're in an actual live scene. That's it in a nutshell on the API side. Now, if you, any of you people have actually tried to program in WebGL to the metal, like as in, you know, use the actual like low-level API that comes with the browser, it's pretty hardcore and it's pretty hard to deal with. So most people use some libraries and tools to help them. So I'm going to just spend a few minutes talking about what that ecosystem might look like. I, I still need to move around a little bit. I'm getting really like jittery here. Got off a plane late last night. So I'm going to pace a little bit with my uh, clicker. Uh, so first off, we have these frameworks um, and, and JavaScript libraries like 3.js. It's the most popular one. This is all open source code. And it, it takes the sort of guesswork out of doing WebGL rendering. It gives you objects like cameras, lights, cubes. Polygon meshes, the things you're familiar with if you're using a modeling tool like Maya or if you're doing your VR in Unity or any of these other systems, it makes it look a lot more familiar like that. And you're just writing simple JavaScript code instead of having to sort of manage drawing triangles and doing all this low-level stuff. And then that's been so successful, people have started building frameworks on top of that uh, to kind of make it look more like HTML with markup. So there's a system I worked on a couple years ago called Glam. Mozilla has built one called A-Frame, which is getting really popular for, for building in web VR. Um, Oculus just announced something called React VR. So at their developer conference, they not only announced their new browser, but that they're working on an extension to the React framework for web programming that gives you 3D capability and VR capability. Um, and I was actually working with them on that uh, prior to Oculus Connect and sort of giving them some d design review and feedback on that. But the basic point is, instead of having to write lines and lines of even 3JS code, which is really easy uh, to say, put up a cube, add it to the scene, put a camera here, do all that, this, in the framework you just put up a tag that says cube. And uh, you know, the, the, the system underlying just knows how to do everything. It sort of builds in a, you know, some viewer code for you. It doesn't, you don't have to hand manage that. So it would do the head tracking and, and you don't even have to worry about setting your cameras up. It just takes care of all of it for you. So that's really cool. And then there's this little uh, piece of technology called the WebVR polyfill. I'm gonna talk about it again in a second, but it, it lets you do all this new fangled WebVR stuff, but it can, you can also do old style uh, WebVR side, side by side drawing for cardboard. So you can use a mobile phone to do this stuff too. Uh, it sort of emulates the API. It's my 10 minute warning. Okay, turn you off. Uh, there's also this great new file format out there, if I do say so myself. I was on the design team uh, at the Kronos group that worked on this. Kronos is the people, uh, the, the people who standardized WebGL a 3D format called Collada, which was an XML-based model format, so you can get all your data out of Maya, 3D Studio Max, SketchUp, and Blender. Um, but Collada was really big and fat. It was all in XML, uh, so it took a long time to download, and it was slow to parse. So what GLTF is is basically a really tiny little JSON, you know, really lightweight JavaScript description of a scene. So you know, maybe like 2 to 100K of JavaScript data. And then all of your rich data, like your 3D meshes and you know, all the vertex data normals and all the things, that, uh, animations, you know, keyframe animations, the things that are actually big and heavy that would be awful in text, we don't do that way. It's just binary files, and the binary loads right into the browser. So you've got fast download and almost instant load time into the browser. 
and GLTF is getting so popular, I, I, it's kind of blown my mind. Um, it started out with a few folks working on it as a cool idea, but uh, now Oculus has gotten involved, really likes it. Otoy, who does some really great high-end ray trace rendering, um, really into it. And there's just this groundswell of uh, activity around GLTF. So you should go look at it. And it's not just good for web and mobile use and, and for VR use, but it's got a lot of broad use too. So the idea is you would get all your model data out of one of those you know, high-end packages, like Amaya or Max, convert it to GLTF, and there's all kinds of exporters that are being built for this now, and then load it into a VR scene, and you've got some nice compact representation for doing it. So you, you see we're building up this open stack of all these tools that can work together at different uh, you know, phases of the development pipeline. Um, but if you don't want to string all that stuff together yourself, the good news is that you know, the pro tools like Unity and Unreal for years now have been exporting to WebGL, and there's some extensions to that now to do VR. Now these are uh, the, the web VR stuff that goes along with Unity, for example, is done by a third party, but you know, the, the core web GL support, just for the graphics part, Unity has got built into the product and it's been you know, in the betas and now shipped for a while. Um, it's great, it creates really big files because what it does is it actually uses a technology called mscripten. I'm gonna get a little technical for a second here again. Uh, mscripten cross compiles all of the native code for an application into this really gnarly low-level JavaScript that is unreadable and rather bloated in size, but works at very high performance. And it doesn't have all the performance and memory leak issues that native JavaScript does. So people who've had you know, Pro Tools have experimented with, with porting large C++-based systems to Emscript in for a couple of years now. And it works really well, but it's got these big downloads because basically what happens is a piece of Unity or Unreal code comes down uh, the wire, but you need the whole engine to come with it too. So you'll, you know, if you want to build a, a 3D game and deliver it in a browser, you'll probably put up a loader bar for your end user because 20 megabytes of jo like low-level JavaScript come down the wire first before the game starts, right? And that's just for the engine part. Um, that works great for something like an MMO where you've got a user expectation that okay, you know, there's going to be some load screens. I'm used to it. I'm a gamer, right? But you would not want to do that TripAdvisor application that way, for example. What I showed you came over the wire in two seconds. You can't be waiting three minutes or four minutes with a loader bar for your web VR to do like a travel app or a shopping app. No one's going to wait. You've lost them, right? For games, it works great. So, you know, it's an interesting area going forward. And depending on the kind of content and experience you want to build, you may be able to use these exporters that are out there now, or you may not. And then there's a company called Visor, and there's a few other folks doing this kind of thing where they give you in-browser tools and uh, you know, various editing interfaces, and you can create the whole thing in a browser and publish to the web instantly. And they've got some good VR support. Uh, and Sketchfab, a site for uploading models and just sharing them. They've got a VR mode now that'll work in cardboard or in the HMDs. So there's a lot of choices if you want to get into developing and, and publishing your web VR, and, and an impressive amount given that it's it's not even in retail browsers yet, right? But there's a lot of folks working on this. So by the time these browsers get into retail, let's say sometime in 2017, you're going to have a rich ecosystem to work with across the board. Um, I mentioned this a little bit before. So that demo I showed you was really, um, it had some additional challenges when I was working with the folks at Oculus um, because we not only wanted it to work well and do all the right things in HMD, but we wanted anybody who didn't have a Rift or a Gear VR to be able to just see it just on their phone or on their desktop and have it work. So what I showed you, I demoed on the flat screen. I was doing rollovers with my mouse, right? <laughs> so I'm doing rollovers with my mouse and these little pop-ups come up. But it, obviously rollovers don't work on a you know, touch screen, right? So if you've got a phone or a tablet, you actually have to do things with tap. So you're already in responsive web design land already. Now you have to do all that and then get it working inside VR as well, right? So that worked completely differently. VR doesn't let you pop up HTML as pop-ups, so we actually had to code it separately through a different code path. The size and scale of the things we built mattered in VR. It didn't on the flat screen at all. You have no idea what world units you're working in when you're on the flat screen and whether you're 50 feet tall or whatever, and you don't have a sense of that. You're looking at the stuff on the screen and you're pointing, right? But once you're in VR, you're actually in it, so you have to think about how big the, you know, the, the viewer is, and when they look, how these pop-ups, how close they get to them. So all these design issues came about. Um, 
that, you know, it seems like in theory, well, you just write the code once and it's just going to work everywhere. But no, you've actually, yes, I mean, the code does, but you have to design the app and think about, you know, you have to make contingent plans for the different form factors you're designing for. So that was really interesting uh, learning from that. And it's going to be a, a crazy area going forward for people designing this stuff. Um, and then I mentioned there's a piece of code that'll make it easier for you if you want to just deploy this and, and not have to worry and just write to kind of one API that will also make it work on a regular phone. So <clears throat> you can do WebVR today without these new APIs just by using WebGL and drawing side by side to your screen and using the built-in accelerometer. Now with that accelerometer you're getting like, I don't know, 20 hertz head tracking. It's not great. This is why cardboard makes it woozy after a while. There's just a lot of latency and and not enough throughput to do good VR. That's why Gear VR and Daydream exist, you know, because we're going to use souped up head um, tracking um, hardware as well as the optics of, of the lenses. Um, so anyway, but if, if you want to just build that and have it still work for cardboard, you can use a, a great piece of uh, polyfill code. I think I might have the links in the next slide, but if I don't, um, I'll make sure I share them subsequently um, or just look up web VR polyfill. Uh, so I think I, I covered all this, but uh, in detail, we're not quite in retail yet. There's a lot of experimentation going on in terms of you know, performance, but the APIs have finally gelled. Um, so I think we're going to be in a position soon where these get past the developer channel or these one-off developer builds, and they're going to get into retail. Like Nobody's committed exact dates. What we've heard from Google is Daydream is going to be their first ship priority, not desktop Chrome. I think they're thinking numbers there. Again, Carmel is committed. They want to make a good Gear VR browser. Um, there's a group inside W3C, the people who standardize HTML, working on the specification. We just had a killer workshop two weeks ago where we got together in San Jose at Sam Samsung's offices, 120 people working on all kinds of crazy cool design things from the frameworks like A-Frame to additions to the spec to immersive audio. You know, we have web audio API, but what do you need to do to make, you know, immersive work really well? To if you're doing 360 video, do we have the, the right meta tags in the video to know if it's side by side or top bottom? If you're doing stereo, you know, these kind of is it an equal rectangular projection or how are you doing it? So that was really great. There's a whole bunch of stuff springing up in the sort of standards and community world that's really solid. So, you know, these, these slides will be posted and you get all the links to all the uh, stuff you need. And if you want to figure out which browser to use and all that, uh, Brandon Jones from the Chrome team is maintaining webvr.info, which is a really great landing page to get a lot of this information in one place. So that's it, folks. Uh, thank you. I don't know where we are in time. We got about two minutes, or I'm going to say three. Um, so if we got any quick questions, let's do them now, and then you can find me outside after the session. You in front here, yeah. and sta uh, stand up and be loud. Yes, I, I'm loud, so it's going to be easy. Um, on the video game side, the web experience in PlayStation and Xbox is a pain in the neck. Are you considering that the web VR could offer, aside of the standard war that can come with this, the web experience using consoles, given the fact that the entry level in terms of costs, for example, for PlayStation VR, might be easier? So the entry level experience for a developer, you're talking about developing on consoles Both. or for well, the yeah, end user? I was Right, for the developer, yeah. So getting, getting into the console development game, is, is, if you've ever tried it, is hard. I mean, there's like, besides the learning curve technically, there's licensing, there's getting approved as being a developer, all that stuff that if you do apps now, it makes app development and deployment look trivial. Um, so the question was, you know, is, there any, is, is WebVR a hopeful way for some people to get onboarded to deliver experiences in console environments as well? Uh, theoretically. Um, it's not clear whether any of the people making those console systems would ever create and market a, a browser that would, you know, allow that. And if, you know, if you think about the, the sort of mentality of the ecosystem there, I bet the folks would be very scared to do that because they'd be worried they'd unleash pe a way for people to get around selling titles, which is yeah. how they make their money. They don't make the money selling the Xbox or the PS4. They make it on the titles on the back end, right? Um, but, you know, potentially in limited ways, the Sony PS4 already has WebGL built into it, but it's used to build the PS4 store. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was crazy. WebGL actually got a bump of another 20 million seats just out of, you know, the PS4 being in there. But it, again, it's only used for the interface to the store to do really, you know, high performance, you know, 2.5D transparency rollovers. They may have a little 3D special effects sprinkled in there, uh, but they're not, they didn't make it a general platform for delivering, uh, you know, developer user content. 
Time for one more, and then we can go outside. I'm going to be, um, uh, he had his hand up earlier, sorry. That's a great question. I actually touched on it earlier, but I didn't dig into it. So the question is, do, do the browsers have a way to look at the standard web with, you know, basically tiles, 2D tiles floating up there that then get you access to web stuff or web VR experiences? Um, it's all being worked on. The Samsung Internet browser for Gear VR was the first to show this off, and it basically presented existing web content in a similar manner to the, you know, Oculus Home interface. We had tiles up in front of you. Um, it would even let you through a very onerous neck strainy gaze and tap interface to search, like a, you bring up a virtual keyboard and look at each key, you know, it's Gear VR, so it's gaze and tap, right? You're like, so that was horrible, but I mean, it was a good start. It'd be really great if you could just talk to the thing with voice if you think about it, right? I mean, just Alexa, you know, take me to. Um, so, but, but it worked and, you know, it gave you this, you know, really nice little rendering of thumbnails of each page. It would take you there and if it was just a regular web page, it would display the page on a 2D surface if it had WebVR content, it could bring you right into the WebVR experience. Google's working on something like that for Daydream with no details disclosed yet, but they've mentioned it at that workshop I was talking about a few weeks ago. Um, I'm gonna guess Oculus is gonna do something like this too. So anybody who's got a browser, they're gonna wanna give you the capability that when you're in VR, you don't have to jump out to go find the next VR experience, right? So the, the on-ramp that I described, where I send you a link and you hit it on the flat screen first, is freaking huge for discovery. It's great, right? Because a lot of people are gonna be just like in their Facebook feed and get this link and then jump right in. Boom, that's gonna be great. But once you're in there, you don't wanna have to jump back out to do it again, right? So that's when what you're talking about is really gonna come into play and have a ton of power. And it's so, uh, long story short though, it's very early. Okay, sorry, we're out of time. I don't, is there another session right now or is there coffee break? Who knows what's going on? 10, 15 sessions. All right, we can hang out out there for five or eight minutes. Uh, good to meet you all. Thank you.